with me here today, Michael Whitchurch. He's at the Brigham Young University's uh, Harold B. Lee Library, and he's the Information Commons uh, manager, and he's done a lot of things in leadership in the past, and still is doing a lot of leadership things. And as I was searching through the canvas of leaders in Utah, my, uh, right up at the top of my list is Michael Whitchurch. I've heard him speak on leadership topics before, and I know him as a man who is getting things done in his own library and is a really influential leader. And so that's why I thought it was important to bring him to you today. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to learn things from him. We want this to be an engaging meeting, and so I'm hoping as time goes forth that you'll use this as a discussion period where you can talk and ask questions of him. And if you've got any burning questions, I'm sure that he'd be happy to talk to you about that. So with that, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to Michael. Okay. Thank you, Colleen. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I always love working with Colleen. I've done a couple things for her before. And this is just a great place to come. I live down in Utah County. Fortunately, the commute was okay today. <laughs> Those of you from Utah actually understand that sometimes that's not the case. I work at Brigham Young University, private uh, church-related institution, and I love it there. It's a great place to be. I've been there over nine years. I started there six months after they opened their brand new information commons, and then they said, more or less, have fun which to some people may be a little nerve-wracking. For me, it was just so exciting to have a new something to take my time. And it's such, such a wonderful opportunity for me. So today, we're going to talk about the whole leader. I don't really like the title, though I couldn't come up with something that worked better. Because that's really what we're trying to become as a whole leader, a leader that uses all of the things we've learned in our past experiences, uh, other people's experiences, things we've read, things we've participated in, and try to become the whole leader, the, the leader that can actually lead whatever it is in the direction that it needs to go. Make sense? Anybody here not expecting that? Because, <laughs> <laughs> really. Too bad. Um, I had an opportunity to work with Kenning, and he's also a wonderful person, so I appreciate you coming here and listening to me instead of listening to him. Um, so today, first question, are you a leader? Anybody here who's a leader, raise your hand. If your hand's not raised, raise it. Okay. <laughs> Everybody can and should be a leader. So why do I say that? Like Colleen said, I really like participation. Why is it that we, despite whatever level we are hierarchically, we can and should be leaders? We're always influencing people, whether you intend to or not. We are all, always influencing people. We take responsibility for things you do. Exactly. Regardless of where we are, we have certain responsibilities. <laughs> and oftentimes, our responsibilities, let me approach it from a different direction. <laughs> Often our bosses don't know what we do. <laughs> and, and really that's the truth. And, and it's not that they don't know what we, they know what we're supposed to do, but they don't know exactly what we do. So oftentimes in our responsibilities, we know what we do, how things should be done, and how they are done the best way. Our leadership then is not necessarily telling our bosses what to do. Not recommend it. However, our leadership is saying, this is how we do it. This is what works well. And you should take this into consideration as you're deciding which direction to take our library. That's how we're leaders. It's not the only way. It's one of the ways. In the world we live in today, it's crazy. I don't know what your experience is, but at least at my institution, things are changing pretty much every day, if not hourly. Things continue to change. It's a tough but very exciting time to be a leader, regardless of what level you're on. 
So now from you, I want, if you would, just really quickly, list some characteristics of le good leaders. So think about good leaders that you know. Could be a current leader. It could be someone under you. What characteristics do they have? Good listeners. Okay. What else? Organized. Organized. They empower people. Empowerment. That is such a loaded word. <laughs> we could do a whole hour of just empowerment. If you haven't been to one, they're actually a lot of fun. What else? Risk taking. Risk taking. Compassionate. Compassionate. Compassionate listener. That's good. What else? Respectful. Respectful. Flexible. <laughs> Anybody had an inflexible boss before? <laughs> and yet can make decisions. And yet can make, make decisions. Okay. Anything else? Motivator. Motivator. Usually motivating toward their ends. That w motivating you toward what they want. Anything else just come off the top of your head? Patient. Patient. And yet still gets things done. <laughs> Vision. vision. So at your institutions, do you have mission, vision, and values? All those things. What do they mean? I'm just going to leave that question there for you to ponder. <laughs> okay, here are some that, uh, as, as I was preparing this, just words that came to me before I even did any looking up, just I brainstormed. Uh, I'm going to try not to mention the ones that have already been, been mentioned. So bulldog. I've had some good leaders that are bulldogs. Attentive, open, intentional. We're going to get to intentional in a minute. Strategic. Anybody have a strategic uh, plan in place? I'll ask that same question. What does it mean? Impulsive. Okay. Yeah, thoughtful, self-assured, communicator, connected, personable, knowledgeable, recognizing talent, passionate, and compassionate, which I believe are two different things. So I did a search. You guys all know about word clouds, right? Yeah. So I just did a search, and this is one of the images that came up. And if you notice, a, a bunch of the words we've talked about are there. These are good leaders. How many of the good leaders that you've known had all of these characteristics? How, mu how many of the good leaders, now I'm asking you good leaders multiple, have had the same combination of these characteristics? None. So what makes a good leader? So now, I want you to take out a piece of paper, just really quickly, jot down which of the characteristics that you know do you already possess? And this is where you kind of get to be egotistical, I guess. What characteristics do you already possess of a good leader, of good leaders that you've known before? Or we can go back and I'll just leave this up for you. So the words we used or some of these. Okay. I would recommend that you take some time to sit down and do this later when you have more time. It's very, what's the word? Self-enlightening, sometimes not in a good way. It's always in a good way, but sometimes you realize, you know, that's a characteristic I should have but don't. Mm -hmm. So how do you know you have these characteristics? Does somebody tell you? Sometimes they do. Now, a good leader 
will tell the people they lead their good characteristics. In my institution, I'm a department chair. I lead, I'll put that in quotation marks because our leadership is very collaborative, which I actually prefer. I get to meet with each of the people in my department one-on-one -on -one every month. One of the things I try to do is exactly that. What have you been doing for the last month? What are your goals for the year? How are you doing? Are you attaining your goals? And then always, any of you parents? Okay. So it's the same with dealing with children. And if you have nieces or nephews, young children you deal with, it's the same thing. Every it's the same thing. <laughs> Don't get me started about cats. We'll have a conversation later about how I grew up, my opinion of cats. You won't like it. <laughs> um, although, no, okay. So it's the same thing with children. It's the same thing with everybody you deal with. Everybody wants, I'm going to call them compliments, but that's not really what it is. Everybody wants to know what they're doing well. How am I doing? How can I get better? It's in our nature to want to become better. And if we keep that foremost in our minds, everybody wants to be better. Then we can approach that and be passionate and compassionate, a good listener. All of these characteristics, we can be that person to the people we lead while at the same time guiding them. Sometimes they will feel harshly in the direction we need them to go. So now that you know what you are, in these characteristics, what do you do about it? That's why this exercise is so good to list what characters you have. Then you have to define those characters for you. Recognize what you don't have and maybe some of these areas that you can work on. Recognize what you don't have. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And you do need to recognize the, the weaknesses as well. Right. But don't work so hard on them and, and ignore what you're good at. And good at yes. And what you find as you work toward your strengths is those weaknesses, because you've recognized them, they're always in the back of your mind. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the old adage that if you focus on the good, that's what you'll see. If you focus on the bad, that's what you'll see. If you focus on your strengths, you become stronger while recognizing the weaknesses, which also become stronger. Whereas if you focus on the weaknesses, they will become stronger weaknesses. I don't know if that, <laughs> that, that is very, that, that's exactly what it is, toxic. It becomes, it's a trap you get caught in. And if you get caught in that trap, it's a downward spiral. Well, and what Trish is just saying with strength finders is like there's actually a, a second step, and it's the fact of the matter is you're then supposed to surround yourself with people who make up for your, your weaknesses, so that you don't have to worry about it as much. As a leader, you, you just worry about finding good people who fulfill those roles. Right. How many of you actually have the opportunity to surround yourself with the people you want? I'm glad you do. I actually don't. <laughs> When I became a department chair, it was your department chair of this department. Great. Fortunately, I have the best department in the library. Of course I would say that. But actually, my former boss, <coughs> one of the AUL's so assistant university librarians, told me the same thing. But part of it is that we complement each other so well. All the characteristics we need in our department are there. And we can rely on each other to get whatever's done, done. Now this next question, this is perhaps one of the most important questions that you'll ask yourself. And it follows on the heels of all these other important questions. What are the characteristics you've got, but at the same time, what do you do about it? And now, where am I going? How many of you know what job you want to end up doing when you retire? 
Okay, a couple of you do, good. That's where you need to be. How many of you are expecting actually to be in that position when you retire? I'm very glad for you and expecting it is actually good. Chances are the path may divert and you never know because opportunities arise. And even though that's where you want to be, you need to be aware of the opportunities and not stifle yourself. Okay. Where are we next? All righty. Now we're going to get into some fun stuff. Theories of leadership. How many of you have heard of these theories of leadership? What have you heard? What theories of leadership have you heard about or been to presentations or whatever? Well, I, I just had an actual leadership class from the university. And okay. I think what, a lot of what is bouncing back and right forth right now in, in the literature is if whether or not you can actually change your leadership style. So they're talking about these different categories and there's all this discussion of the 15%. You can change about 15% of what you do and the thought that you can't change anything about yourself. Like, so you just need to find your strengths, accentuate those strengths, be self-aware. Um, but the best leadership one that I've been around lately was is a book called True North by Bill George. It's one of the best books I've ever read as far as just nonfiction. And it's, it's, it's about value-based leadership and understanding what your values are and you know, self-awareness and sticking to them. Okay. True North. I'm going to have to write that down. Remind me after. So <laughs> no, it's, I, amazing, it's an amazing book. I love reading leadership books. They give me so much information about me. And that's what it is. It's very introspective. I just came from a week-long leadership institute. And, the, and when we taught it, um, we covered 20 different theories and different parts. It's kind of what area you were talking about. This, this theory is good here. This theory is good here. So we just wondered about there are hundreds of theories on leadership, really. Now, these are just a few of the books. You're familiar with some of them, I'm sure. The reason I put these up is I found it quite humorous as I was going through books I've read and other books about leadership. And how many of them have numbers? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> and they're all trying to enumerate something. If you do these four things, you're going to be a good leader. How many, how often is it some number that you've gone through? The most famous, perhaps, is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which, ironically, I haven't read. I, I mean, it was written by a Utahn. I haven't read it. I haven't read The Eighth Habit either. Anyway, I've read most of these other ones. So why do we call them theories? <laughs> and you know, I love the word soft. You've got the hard sciences, chemistry, and even sometimes those can be soft. But on the other side, you have the behavioral sciences, the soft sciences, the sciences that are about people. And do you know anybody that's exactly like you? Or are you exactly like any of the authors of these books? We're not. <laughs> We're all individuals. So what does that mean about these theories? <laughs> their theories, what was that? They have to have a, a flexibility built into their, you know, their structure. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And where does that flexibility come from? Well, the continuum of human beings that we all are. Right? right. And who creates that flexibility? We do. We read it and we say, you know, this, this is me. This is exactly me. You ever done that? You're hearing, reading, whatever, and you listen to something that says, ugh, yeah, that's me. I got to do something about that. And other times you're thinking, what? <laughs> that has no application to me or to my situation. And then 10 years down the road, you read the same book and you realize, well, it certainly does now, but that other thing doesn't. It's flexible. They're theories. It's all about reading these and saying, this works for me.
When I was an undergraduate in college, my major was psychology. Somebody's having fun. <laughs> psychology after many majors before that. Um, I had a professor who was brilliant. One of those experiences for me that really opened my eyes and actually formed the foundation of what we're talking about now. Any here psychologists? Took a psychology class in college? OK. How many theories were there in psychology? <laughs> Hundreds. OK, same as leadership. Which one's the right one for human behavior? And yet, how many psychologists try to put themselves in that box of this is the theory I am going to promote? I'm going to use this in my practice, in my teaching. Well, this professor of mine, he thought differently. And he said, well, all of these theories have something good in them. Well, I don't I just, when I, was, when I was in college, I think he approached it wrong. At the time, I thought it was really cool. So what he said is, why don't I just grab everything that's good from all these theories and create one of my own? Which in my mind kind of defeated the purpose. You're creating a new theory from everybody else's theory, which. It's the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> it's another theory. It's another. What he really needed to do in my mind was actually create a way of thinking. It's not a new theory. It's a way of saying all of these theories have application in some circumstance. So what circumstances are there? And how can I take those and apply them to the different situations that I'm in, be it teaching or counseling or whatever it is? It's the same thing here. We have all of these leadership theories. What do we do with them? I know for me, I can't take one of these and say, this is me. And this is how I'm going to approach everything I do in my leadership. Because I'm different than the authors that wrote this. But they have such good information, I need to look at it. They studied it. So how do we do that? We're going to do a little exercise. Have any of you heard of this book? It's called Reframing Academic Leadership. This summer, I had the opportunity to go to Harvard. I'm a Harvard graduate now. Sorry, I was there for a week. I, I went to Harvard. There you go. I spent a week in, at Harvard participating in the Leadership Institute for Academic Librarians. By the way, how many here are academic librarians? Nobody. Wow. Is everybody else public library? OK. Well, the other session deals specifically with academic libraries and what they, what they do. Um, so this one was particularly for academic librarians. But it, this, this reframing academic leadership is actually a really good book for the thing we're going to do right now. It talks about four frames. And it, they're frames of leadership. What we're going to do today, if you'll take this paper right on the front, and this needs to be stream of consciousness. It, you can't really think too much about this. It's very similar to a personality test, although this isn't telling you anything about your personality. So just answer these questions really quickly. You need to number them one through four. So one is, the, or one is the one that describes you least, four is the one that describes you most. When you're done filling those out at the bottom, there are some places to total. So all of the A's you need to total up and put in the ST box. All of the B's in the HR, all of the C's in the PL, and all of the D's in the SY. So total them up and put them in there. It should all total 60. Okay, when you're done totaling, if you'll turn the page over to this uh, quadrant, I guess. So the ST stands for 
HR stands for human resource. SY stands for symbolic and PL for political. Mark them where they are. Once you're done, draw a, it will look somewhat like a kite. So connect the dots. This is just a visual exercise. Yes. No, she hates structures, what she hates. <laughs> you two are very similar, though. We are. Look at that. So, it's a really fascinating experience. Yeah, look at your neighbors, look around, see what they look like. <laughs> yes, I, I understand. Okay. So you found, you found some problems with this particular exercise. Some of the numbers you got just aren't even on the paper, right? So now the question that we need to answer here is, what does this tell you about yourself? <laughs> if you are, you're not the only one. <laughs> How many of you have a perfectly balanced diamond? Really? That's impressive. What you'll find is it's very rare for someone to be that balanced. That's actually very, very impressive. I have seen no one. In other words, you're weird. He's the, <laughs> he's the Yoda of librarians. Yeah, there we go. So why am I standing up here instead of him? <laughs> he's the balanced one. I'm totally imbalanced. So what does this tell us? Let, let's go through these four. Talk about them. Talk about what they mean. <clears throat> so in this book, and I do highly recommend that you take some time to read this book. It is for academic institutions, yes. And I apologize that you'd have to be reading something that's focusing on academic instead of public. I know that's kind of hard. But that explains it a lot better and a lot more deeply than I can. But we'll go through these four. So the first one, the structural. This is a person, so each of them has a metaphor. In other words, the interactions with people, what, what they're like. This metaphor is a factory or a machine. So if you're really structural, you like structure, you like things to be in their place. So it's the logic rationality. Human resource. What's very interesting, the majority of the people at this institute that I attended were very high in human resource. In other words, they like dealing with people. So this is a family. So the interactions in a family, it's very cordial, it's very loving, very supportive. Political. How many here are highest on political? Or one of their highest ones? <laughs> that one, for most of us at this institute, was the lowest. And it was definitely my lowest. I am not a political animal. Now I said animal, <clears throat> what's the metaphor for this? It's a jungle. A political jungle. It's dog eat dog. It's, this is how many resources we have and I want them. Okay. The last is symbolic. This one for me is the hardest to comprehend. Not because it's my lowest, because it's so out there. It's so ethereal. It's so 
I can't think of the right word. It's, the metaphor is a temple, a carnival, a theater, and so a person that's like this is a symbol. He or she deals with interactions symbolically. Great example of a symbolic leader would be Gandhi. Very symbolic. So what does this mean for you? So if, you, if you're highest in political, does that mean you're our political animal and that's, that's just the way you are. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, we already heard the answer. Every time we take this test, it's going to be different. I've done it three times. And every single time, it has been different. Why do you think that would be? Now, different meaning the little kite kind of changes its shape. Why do you think there are differences every time we do this? My job is different. And if I'm doing this in the context of how people I work with, you know, Lisa and I were just talking about it, I changed jobs about six Completely. So it looks completely different than it was six months ago because of um, the And I love the word context. The word context is what, what it means. Depending on the context you're in will depend on how you're going to approach things. Now, the thing I want you to know about this is this does not tell you this is exactly the way you are. It is a theory. We already talked about theories. It is another way to look at things. But what this does tell you is this is your preferred method of dealing with people. So I'm really high on the human resource and the structural. I like that. So for me, I like being able to deal with people in a very kind, compassionate sort of way. I do not like fighting for funds. That's my lowest, which interestingly is opposite human resources. So what this is, is this is your preferred method of dealing with a certain circumstance, with dealing with people. The context that you're in at the time, that is all it is. But if you recognize and understand each of these, you can get to a point where you will understand just by talking with someone what their preferred frame is. And you'll also understand what your preferred frame is, what theirs is, and be able to talk their same language. Because a politician talks to a politician. They understand each other. That's the way it is. Those of you who have children, same kind of thing. There are some children you can talk to and you just get them. They just get you. Other children you talk to, it doesn't work. It's the same in the workplace. So if you can understand where they're coming from, where you're coming from, talk their same language, and being able to understand it, it is really, really powerful. And there is power to understanding the people you're working with. That is, that's the value of this. It's also the value of every other theory that you're going to read. It teaches you about yourself. And if you look at it from a different perspective, it also teaches you about the people you're dealing with. How is it I can help them to understand me? How can I understand them? That's the power of theories. The reason I brought this one is I was just introduced to it this summer. And it has helped me so much in understanding the way other people are approaching what it is that we're doing. Any comments or suggestions, questions about this? OK, and just so you know, the author, Lee Bowman, he actually wrote a different book that was more focused on reframing, oh, what is it called? I just looked at it, and I can't remember what it was called. It's another reframing book, Reframing Organizations. That was the first book he wrote, Reframing Organizations. It uses the same four frames, but on a grander organizational scale. This one focuses more on academic leadership. So maybe Reframing Organizations would be the one that you would prefer to read, because then you wouldn't have to read an academic book. I don't know. It's up to you. There you go. <laughs> Academics speak a very different language than publics, than specials, than any other librarians. It, it's just the way it is. And so if we can understand how we 
speak to each other, then we can actually collaborate better on projects or other things we're dealing with. So leadership goes beyond your own institution. So I told you we'd come back to intentional. What does that mean? I think it's being intentional is the side effect of being self-aware. Like if you know who you are and you know what your weaknesses, strengths are, then you are in a place where you can make decisions and be intentional with your employees, be intentional with yourself, be intentional with what your organization's doing. But a lot of that comes back to, you know, just like you, you do a, an analysis before you do a strategic, strategic plan, you have to do a self-awareness analysis before you jump in as an intentional leader. Right. How many who've actually done that? When you've been given a new leadership position, you sat down taking the time to say, well, who am I in this situation? What are my strengths or what are my weaknesses? Have you ever done that? A couple of you have. I haven't, and I'll tell you why in a second. So I'm going to give you a couple definitions of intentional. I love the OED, by the way, Oxford English Dictionary. How many of you here could just get lost in a dictionary? Just reading? OK, so now my question is, those of you that love it, What's your frame? <laughs> Is there any correlation between that? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So. Well, if you do get lost in it, you all need to read the Etymologicon and the Horologicon, because they're the best word books I've ever read. <laughs> Etymologic Horologicon? The Etymologicon and the Horologicon. Which are? They're books about words. They're books about etymology. Uh, etymology fascinates me. It truly does. So some definitions. So in the OED, I looked up both intention and intent. So intention, done on purpose, resulting from intention, intended. I hate it when definitions use their own word. I thought that was one of the rules, but OED does it all the time. It's cheating. I agree. Pertaining to the operations of the mind, mental. And then for intent, design, plan, pro project, scheme. Okay. I guess that's project. Attention, heed, intent, intent observation. Again, that same word. An end purposed, an object of action, etc., an aim. So being an intentional leader means you know where you're going and you want to get there. Now we're going to talk a little bit about me. My life, I have been a leader on multiple occasions. I have never actually sat back, looked at myself, and said, this is what I need to do, this is what I need to improve, this is how I need to get there. I've always done it by gut reaction. And it served me pretty well, actually. However, sir, going by gut reaction is not enough. I'm now to a point in my career where if I don't do things by intent when it comes to leadership, I'm stuck. I guess that's the way to put it. I cannot go any further in my career until I intentionally become the leader I want to become. So when it says an aim, what do I want to be? I asked the question earlier, how many of you know exactly where you want to end up when you retire? Three people raised their hands. If you don't find out, and once you find out, how are you going to get there? Intentionally go for what you need. One of the things I did this year was I attended this institute, and it taught me so much about intent, about actually consciously thinking, where am I going? How can I get there? And if we do that, we will get there. If we don't, like me, I would get stuck in this position for as long as they would have me. I'm at an academic institution, so I could pretty much stay there as long as I wanted if I don't get bored first. <laughs> but that's the other thing, I don't want to get bored. All right, we're, low, we're, we're kind of winding down to the last part of this particular discussion. What next? You've been here, you've heard these theories, you've read theories, you've heard about the four frames, now what? 
How do we go into the future in our institutions, regardless, you know, at the beginning we talked about who's a leader, we all are. Regardless of where we are in the hierarchy, how do we get to where we need to go next? Now this iLead program has been eight months, right? How's it been? What's been one couple of the best things that have come out of this experience? Access to the resources. Okay. Access to resources. When you say resources, what do you mean? There were a lot of intercessions. I don't know if you're aware how it was set up. I'm not. There were a lot of intercessions we could participate in when we weren't actually meeting up here. Okay. The, and they were hour long, which made it a really nice time frame, too, to be able to accomplish them. And it, they were amazing resources. Okay. What else have you gotten out of this experience that you're going to be taking forward? Colleagues that will support me and help me stay on task. Okay. Colleagues to support and, and help. You need the support. <laughs> That's one of the things when I was at Harvard that I actually got. The camaraderie that we felt during that week. We can go to each other now and say, you know, I, I'm at a loss of what to do in this case. Can you help me out? What else? Learn anything else from this experience? Better understanding myself. There was done like a lot of um, things as a PhD student. Training yourself is a good thing. A lot of introspection. So you've learned a lot about yourself. OK. I think that's going to help you in your future leadership. <laughs> Sometimes you're thrown into situations where you get this person that is now working for you that you've got to reform or do something about, and other personalities you're dealing with. I'm going to take two of those things that, that you've talked about, and I'm going to connect them. The first is you've learned so much about yourself. The second is you've got this camaraderie in this group. So what I would like you to do is write down a goal. And after you've written this goal, I want you to share it with your comrades in arms. Oh, wait, no arms here. <laughs> comrades in knowledge, how is that? And specifically set up a date where you're going to be contacted by one of your partners to see how you're doing on that goal. Okay. For leadership. So in your, in your different circumstances, and I know this is going to be difficult. I do understand it's difficult. It's one of the things I actually had to do in this institute. One goal when it comes to leadership. It could be a goal, I am going to pick up a book of leader, about leadership. I'll go to the next slide. These are some of the books that you can read, and these are very few that you could actually read. It could be that goal, I want to pick up a goal on leadership, and I want to read it and see how it applies to me. Could be a goal, I have someone that works for me, and I need to find out what frame they are in, what, how they are approaching the different circumstances we're in. Okay, some goal when it comes to leadership, how can I become a better leader? Perhaps your goal is take a half hour to sit down, brainstorm my strengths, my weaknesses, and how I'm going to strengthen my strengths while keeping the weaknesses in mind. Whatever personal goal you want to write. I don't think you learn about being a leadership by learning how to be a leader. You learn about it when you are the leader and realize you need to change things up. Any directors of libraries here? When you were made director, were you ready? 
Oh, absolutely not. I haven't ever worked in a library. <laughs> You're rarely ready for a leadership opportunity. Oh, a lot and learned about our trainings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Trish. True North by Bill George is one of the best books ever. And the Jim Collins ones are awesome. Because they, he, has, he has great by choice as well, besides good to great. Right. And then anything by Warren Bennett. I had to read a bunch of those for my leadership class as well. He's kind of the guru of leadership. Didn't you say Drew North was right now? Bill George. And Warren Bennett leads the Leadership Institute at USC. So y'all have your goal? All ready to go. Have you shared it with a partner? Share it with your partner. And then get your partner's email address and set up a time. I will email you on this day to ask you where you are with your goal. I would recommend that you say how many you're going to watch. Give yourself a number. Well, be more specific? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, seriously, my goal would be to see them all. By when? Um, well, we had to do five by this goal. I get it. When I started working on the other ones, I was like, oh, that was too long. That was too long. I really would. For this specific goal, I would recommend making it specific and saying, by the end of November, I will have watched four. I, I don't know. The reason I recommend that is giving a specific number. It, it gives you really something to look forward to. Exactly. But if you, if you make that goal, by this date, I'm going to do this. Time's pretty much up. One other, one other book I am going to recommend is that first one on there, The Four Disciplines of Execution. That's, that's one that I just recently read. And it's one we're trying to actually implement in our library, Four Disciplines of Execution. It talks about your wildly important goals. Again, it's another theory that has four disciplines, and they're great. They really are, all four of them. They have to be implemented differently in different ways. It's another tool in your toolbox to apply to your personal. The reason I brought that up is up here we were talking about goals, how goals really need to be specific. They need to be timely. I'm going to do this by this time. And that book talks about that kind of a goal. A specific Yep, specific. We are going to accomplish this by this time, and this is how we're going to do it. That's how a goal is really good. I will be sticking around. If you have any questions or want to chat or talk about things, I'm welcome to talk to you. But my time actually is up because it's lunchtime, right? And you don't want to miss lunch. It's just food. Thank you.